Good morning, welcome to Alabama EMS Challenge. Thanks for all those joining us online and here in person at Trustful Fire Department. Uh, Dr. Ferguson had to step away for an emergency, and uh, so this is a good opportunity for us to introduce our new uh, EMS fellow for next year. Is Dr. Kevin hey, Gunnuth? Am I definitely right, Doc? Close enough. Close enough. Okay. Uh, so he's uh, graciously uh, um, offered to, to stand in with a with a lecture, and uh, glad to have him. So take it away, Doc. This is working. All right, I'm Kevin Gutermith. I'm actually a pediatrician by training. Um, did PZM fellowship at Children's and now staying on as the EMS fellow. I was a paramedic way back when. It's taken me 10 years to get back to what uh, initially got me into medicine with pre-hospital care. Um, so as Wes said, um, Dr. Ferguson had to step away. So I'm going to be filling in and giving Blake Davidson, last year's EMS Fellows, pediatric cardiac arrest uh, lecture um, so we can grade him and see how well he did kind of telling you guys about pediatrics. Um, I also don't have any disclosures, neither did Blake. So um, our goal is going to be to talk about neonatal and pediatric cardiac arrest and kind of some of the pathophysiology that changes kind of right after an infant is born and as they grow older. Uh, we'll talk about dosing and then um, common causes. Spoiler alert, it's a lot of respiratory pathology. Um, so as far as neonatal resuscitation go, about 10% of all births, at least in the hospital, require some form of resuscitation. And I know y'all, as well as from my experience, it's oftentimes you're not in the hospital doing these resuscitations. It's oftentimes the home births that go sideways. Um, and there are a lot of home births that go well, uh, but when they go sideways, you, you got to be able to step in and kind of troubleshoot the problems while making a timely and safe transport. Um, and, you know, lots of complications during pregnancy, talk about hypertension, infections, um, poor growth, um, placental kind of problems. All of these things can affect not only mom, but also the baby. So in these situations, you oftentimes have double the stress because you have double the patients. Um, and then as much history as you can, I don't know how many times you guys have tried to talk to pregnant women or you know, post-pregnant women about kind of what complications, but oftentimes those nine months end up being a blur for them. Um, so it's hard to try and get some accurate history. And certainly your neonatal patient who is a handful of minutes old can't tell you anything. Um, as far as physical exam goes, we're going to basically talk about APGAR, which is it's named after Virginia Apgar, who was a pediatrician who kind of came up with this modeling algorithm. If you look at the neonatal resuscitation guidelines, um, you know, typically the baby is born and then within that first minute, you're deciding whether or not you need to perform resuscitation. And largely what's going to be within that is going to be repositioning the airway. Remember, kids have these huge heads, right? Terrible tone. So they're always come out and they're always floppy. And especially they can come out stunned if things were kind of rough, if the you know neat delivery environment was not optimal for them. So if mom was super hypertensive and got a lot of magnesium, they're going to come out floppy. Or if it was a placental abruption, there's blood everywhere, then the baby's also likely lost a lot of their blood volume. But the goal within that first minute of life is to really kind of optimize their airway and kind of correct a lot of these things. Um, because the APGAR, you can't score an APGAR until one minute of life. So really, you need to like make a decision. Do I need to resuscitate this baby or not? And that's going to be warm, dry, stim. Crank the heat up in the back of the truck. Um, get some warm blankets on them and kind of dry them off. And that's really only true for babies who are not preterm. If they're less than 30 weeks, usually what we'll end up doing is putting them in a plastic bag and basically kind of trying to create like a greenhouse effect for them to kind of keep them warm and keep all those kind of fluids within them because their thin is, their skin is so thin that they will lose a lot of uh, moisture. Um, so APGAR, you don't have to remember it always. Um, the most important things are going to be your pulse and respirations. Um, and those are two of the things that really kind of help predict, um, you know, mortality going forward and kind of risk of cerebral palsy. Um, the least important one would be appearance or color. Um, most babies come out looking purple and it's not uncommon for babies at one minute of life to have an APGAR of eight with minus two for color and those babies go on to do just fine. Um, 
blood glucose certainly uh, in babies who are born to um, diabetic moms. Um, they're at risk for neonatal hypoglycemia because mom's insulin levels have been so high. And then when they're removed from that high glucose environment, um, they can come out floppy. So it's reasonable to check that. And usually you just do a heel stick in order to be able to get that. Um, and then each of these is scored on um, a three point scale of either zero up to two. Nobody gets a 10 like ever. Um, there's always something that's wrong. It's usually color um, and even at five minutes. And oftentimes they will ask you, what are the APGARs at one, five and 10? Um, so usually what you want to be able to be seeing is an upward trend. You're improving things. And really, I think about APGAR more as a how well are we doing resuscitating the patient? Um, it's really a key indicator to give us feedback on how we are doing as far as optimizing their ventilation, optimizing their oxygenation, because oftentimes these babies will improve with just that. It's very rare that you need to be giving them um, epinephrine or any other kind of uh, medications or even really chest compressions. Usually if you're doing high quality bagging, um, they're going to improve. Um, suctioning, certainly we talk about suctioning the mouth and the nose. Um, and then kind of like we talked about already, the preemies, we usually put them in a bag. Um, and oftentimes if you're in a resource limited setting like we are, you can use something as easy as like a Publix grocery bag um, or the bag that your BVM comes in. You can just pop the baby in there and kind of cinch it down around the face um, in order to be able to have access to that. Um, and you can certainly use if you have, you know, whatever um, available. Uh, so you can, these are probably the patients that are most susceptible to kind of triggering and stimulating the vagal reflex. We still suction in order to clear the airway, do it all the time, um, but Blake says not to, so that's fine. Um, within the first 30 seconds, you're gonna be stimming them. So really kind of vigorously rubbing them, drying them off, um, and then kind of jaw thrusting them, kind of you can do like a shoulder roll or something like that in order to optimize, kind of get them in line. Um, and then if their heart rate kind of this all varies, but really your goal is to keep them above 60 and ideally above 100. That's really what you're aiming for. Um, if they have a heart rate 30 to 60 within that first minute, you're going to start bagging them pretty quickly. Um, usually like in the neonatal resuscitation room, we'll like titrate our FiO2. Really, you guys don't have that luxury, so feel free to just bag them with 100% and that's totally fine. Um, if you were super savvy and you got a pulse ox on super quickly, your expected pulse oximetry for these kids, and you're remembering their physiology in utero is basically reverse of ours. So their right ventricle is doing the majority of the systemic pumping. And then when they come out in the world and their umbilical artery is no longer pumping to them, um, it has to flip and transition. The left ventricle has to take over and start pumping systemically. So there is this gradient. So usually what ends up happening is their pulse oximetry at that first minute is somewhere between 60 to 65, and then goes up by five about each minute of life till about minute 10 when they should be somewhere in like the upper 90s. So if you see that scary number, know that that is expected um, and it will get better kind of as they are further out in the world. Um, Outside of that, I think we kind of talked about those things so far. Um, if they're still less than heart rate of 60 and you've been doing high quality bagging for a minute, that's when NRP says that's when you start chest compressions. And that's going to be kind of interlocking, two thumb kind of technique. NRP is different from PALS, which is different from ACLS, and NRP encourages you to do like a three to one, so like one and two and three, and then you breathe. It's going to be chaotic as hell for you guys, so do whatever you feel comfortable with. 15 to two, whatever is fine, um, just as long as you're kind of pumping and doing something in order to assist these patients. Um, if they're still bradycardic F for a minute of high quality ventilation and chest compressions, then you start thinking about a B. Um, and oftentimes for these kids, if you have ever been with the neonatologist, particularly at UAB, they will just intubate these kids while they're crying. They won't give them RSI meds. They won't paralyze them. They'll just intubate them and kind of in between as their vocal cords are moving, they will shove that tube down. Um, and you can, you know, give them ET tube epi. The other thing that you can do is kind of after you've clipped the umbilical cord, um, you can put a 24 gauge 
right in through kind of the umbilical vein. So there should be two arteries in one vein. You should be able to just kind of put it in there, and that way you can give quick access without having to IO or, or try to stick uh, a newborn slimy baby. So that's always something to keep in your back pocket as well. Um, so typically in this country, we don't resuscitate babies who are less than 22 uh, weeks and zero days. Um, they have abysmal survival rates. They have lots of complications. Um, in other parts of the civilized world, like in France, they typically don't resuscitate less than 24 and zero. Um, and that's just kind of what resources do you have available to you? Um, if you've gone for 10 minutes and they don't have a pulse and they're not getting better, it's reasonable to discontinue um, care, though I can't imagine a situation in which you guys would feel comfortable doing that. And that's something that we are more than happy to take off your hands for them. That being said, I will say for these patients that you do have that are born in the field, Children's is not really equipped to be able to handle that. They should really go to women and infants at UAB. Um, and they can meet you right outside. They have a resuscitation room literally right next to the ambulance bay to be able to do all these things. Um, so that's really the optimal place to go, especially for a baby who's born within several hours. Um, they're much better served over there. If you bring them to us at Children's, it's fine. We'll take care of it and then transfer them over there. Um, peripheral cyanosis can be normal. Central cyanosis, kind of like we talked about, usually, um, as far as their color goes, they're gonna come out purple, blue, and then as kind of their circulations transition, they should get pink and kind of peripherally blue and then kind of um, work their way out. Um, pneumothorax is super uncommon. Um, oftentimes we'll just observe them. For kids who do have tension pneumos, uh, I've never put an 18 gauge in in a neonate, but um, you can put in like a 22 would probably be reasonable, 20 or 22 gauge, um, kind of second midclavicular line, um, hypoglycemia, D10. We do five per kilo and kind of the rule of 50, um, and that's totally fine. And then for gastroschisis or emphalocele, so that's basically they don't have an abdominal wall. So in gastroschisis, their abdominal organs are just hanging out. Usually this is a prenatally known diagnosis, and if they're calling you, then something's gone terribly wrong. Um, Basically, what you do is you wet some gauze with saline and drape it over and then put them in that plastic bag. Emphalocele is their abdominal organs are hanging out, but it has a covering over it. It's sealed in. So that's how I remember the difference between those two things. Usually what happens with those babies is they're born and then promptly transferred over to children's to go for surgery. Um, so, and kids who have gastroschisis and emphalocele are at higher risk for other kind of comorbid conditions. They have some kind of genetic underlying condition. Um, and usually they have multiple other comorbidities that are known about. Some have congenital heart disease and things like that. All right, questions about neonatal resuscitation. Yeah, um, one thing that uh, might be to some of our all, some of all, including me, is not do an oxygen with ventilation. Mm -hmm. uh, speak to that a little bit of what, why wouldn't we use supplemental oxygen? Yeah. So the risk with supplemental oxygen is that you can cause hyperoxia and kind of increase free radicals and all of this kind of stuff. The other thing too is that the neonatal kind of pathophysiology is constantly in flux every minute to minute as they're kind of transitioning. So there has been a, a move away from, you know, flushing these kids with 100% FiO2. And like I was mentioning earlier, oftentimes we'll titrate, we'll start with like 30% FiO2 when we're starting resuscitation on these kids and then titrate down. Um, but if you're in a situation where that's all you have is the canister on the back and it only delivers 100%, it's fine to do that. Um, you know, if you're able to bag with 21% and get the improvement, that's fine too. But I don't think anybody would fault you for giving 100% FiO2 if you're able to um, in order to kind of correct. And the big thing that I would also plug is just kind of being mindful of where you're putting your pulse oximeter. Um, so in these kids, they still have kind of ductal uh, flow. So your right hand is really your only what we call preductal. So before the patent ductus arteriosus. Um, which gives you kind of a sense of what the preoxygenated blood is, whereas every other extremity, left hand and both of your legs are what we call postductal. Um, and these kids have 
oftentimes a patent ductus arteriosus, and that's a normal part of their physiology. And as they're out over those minutes to hours, that closes down as the um, flow flips around. The risk too with that is if you give them 100% FiO2, you can potentially expedite and close that off. Um, so those are just kind of things. If you see these scary numbers, really what you want to be known is the heart rate. And if I could encourage you guys to put a stethoscope on them and like get a true heart rate as well. Don't just rely on the monitor and kind of see what's going on. Um, and then our preferred locations for feeling pulses is going to be brachial as well as femoral. Um, and really, if you can kind of get it like right in between the bicep and the groove there, you should be able to feel it. Um, and these kids with congenital heart disease, oftentimes you can feel some discrepant pulses, but I would never expect any of you guys to, to be doing that out there as you're bopping down the road to us. Uh, but just kind of like trying to gather as much history as you can. Keep them warm. Babies are at really high risk for uh, hypothermia. As we kind of talked about, they have the largest surface um, area to volume of any patient that we see. And that's kind of why we talked about the plastic bags for them already. But other thoughts, concerns? I know I'm throwing a lot of high falutin ideas at you guys here. No? Seeing none? Let's talk about bigger kids. Um, so Blake says that it differs from adult recess in many ways. I think that's partially true. I think if you can master the ABCs on an adult, you can apply a lot of those critical concepts to pediatrics as well. Um, and like I already alluded to earlier, like respiratory arrest is the most common cause of pediatric cardiac arrest. It's usually something that has caused them to spiral out. Um, you know, they got into opiate and have hypoventilation, they were drowning, uh, they had seizures, whatever kind of the causes. It's something that's primarily going to be respiratory associated that then causes them to have a cardiac compromise. Um, we do have much higher kind of rates of ROSC as well as survival to discharge and medication weight-based dosing is all of pediatrics. Um, so we talk about newborns is less than one month old, infants is one month to one year, and the child greater than one year. And you can subsequently break them down elementary age, yada, yada. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to make a plug here real quick for your Braslow tape. If you guys don't know where it is on your next shift, like look and see where it is. That would be something that when we're getting patients from y'all, when you call us, if you can say they are pink on the Braslow, that gives us a lot of information ahead of time. We can make pretty close estimates based on what the ages that you tell us, you know, they're a year old. I'm going to say, okay, they're probably somewhere like 10 kilos, something like that. You know, I can make a guesstimate, but if you can give me a Braslow tape, then I can specifically have medications ready to be drawn up. I can give a more accurate weight to my pharmacist. We can have all of our tools uh, and appropriate sized equipment ready to go rather than this kid was told to be whatever, you know, he's six months. Oh, he actually looks like he's the size of a two month old or something like that and cause all that. So if you guys can get an accurate Braslow tape measurement, that's super helpful, not only for y'all in the field, but also for us at the receiving hospital. There it is. Um, so it will be measured from the top of the head. There'll be a little red triangle and go here and then all the way down to the bottom of the feet. Um, it's very useful. There are a bunch of other apps as well and other kind of commercial devices like hand heavy and things like that that some people use. Um, they're very helpful. I'm a big fan of PDStat. It's a, an app on your phone. And basically you can plug in multiple different things as far as their height, their weight, um, their Braslow color, and it kind of gives you all of these things. So let's say we said it was red eight. And now I have all of my medications, all of my tube sizes, um, all my fluids, all of my medications, your seizures, stuff like that. And oftentimes when you all call me at Children's and I'm talking to you all on the phone, I have this app pulled up so I can be able to give you guys recommendations on kind of medication dosing. I think it costs like five bucks on the app store. And I think it's an app that everybody who is you know, remotely involved in taking care of pediatric patients should have available because it is able to offload a lot of that mental strain from y'all onto your handheld brain. It was called PEDISTAT, P-E-D-I-S-T-A-T. -E um, so again, the Braslow tape and this, these apps have all the same stuff in it, but it kind of gives you your medications 
common dosing, tube equipment sizes, things like that. Um, as far as airways go, we kind of talked about this already when we were talking about neonatal, but these kids have these huge heads, right? Terrible control. They're always like this. You try to sit them up. Really about six months is when they should be able to sit up, kind of at least somewhat unassisted. Six to seven months is kind of that time frame where they're able to sit up. Um, but they still have these giant heads that are oftentimes poor head control. And then when you lay them down, they end up like this. So anything you can do to optimize. So we talked about neck rolls already. Um, they have these big floppy tongues as well. And this is why when kids get upper respiratory infections or things like that, and they're obligate nose breathers, they want to breathe through their nose because this is all bone. This should all be patent. Whereas it's really hard for them to be able to coordinate, like moving their tongue, moving their head, clearing their airway. For us, when we get a cold, we just breathe through our mouths for a while, right? But for them, it's really like difficult for them to overcome. And for kids in particular, infants, feeding for them is their primary way of working out. I always equate it to us hopping on a treadmill and trying to drink a smoothie. Like it's hard work to be able to do it for infants. So anything that is obstructing their ability to breathe, whether that be boogers or mucus, or they got a pee stuck in there, whatever, um, is going to compromise their ability to feed well. Um, and this is why we see so many kids with bronchiolitis, if you guys have heard of that, thinking about upper respiratory tract infection that kind of moves its way down into the lungs. It's not And trying albuterol doesn't really work. Um, it's because all of that mucus that was up here is now way deep down in their lungs and kind of obscuring it. Um, as far as choking goes, kind of back blows, chest thrusts. Um, don't use a blind finger sweep. We've had a couple of kids who've come in with oral foreign bodies um, and come in like fairly abundant. Um, I actually had a kid who came in from Birmingham who'd swallowed a uh, or like put a uh, rubber ball in his mouth. And they initially told us it was a piece of candy and it looked very similar to one, uh, but kind of as soon as you laid him down flat and opened his airway, you could see kind of that ball valve of the actual ball moving up and down against the epiglottis. You're able to go in and just pull it out with some McGill's. Unfortunately, that kid was, he'd been dealing with that for so long that his CO2 had built up to, I think it was like 130 or so. So he was like basically CO2 narcosis. So he got innovated regardless, but it doesn't hurt if you have an abdominal patient and you feel like the story fits that you could take a look and try to McGill something out. Um, all right, so various airway equipments. So we got eye gel, uh, we got our ET tubes, we got our King Airways, and then that is a jerry rigged um, kind of um, surgical crike. Um, these ones. Thankfully, I've never had to do, uh, but they scared the shit out of me of having to be in a situation where you would need to cry a child. Really, what we say is kind of less than 12, then you're going to end up needing to do kind of a needle crike. Um, and really, what we talk about is like a 14 or 16 gauge needle kind of right here. You get the end of a um, 3cc syringe, screw it on, and then pull off kind of the top of the um, cut down the tube and attach it there so that way you can kind of hook in to be able to do that. Um, the other thing that you you would need to do if you're in that situation, please call us but and we can kind of help you walk it through. But um, you're going to have insane bagging pressures. So really all you're doing with that is you're going to be providing passive oxygenation basically. There's no room to ventilate. You can't really ventilate and get rid of CO2 back out through that. So really all you're gonna be doing is forcing 100% oxygen in. So what you need to do on your bags is pop that peep valve, because otherwise you will squeeze and it will hit that high pressure and then it will go and just release all that pressure. You won't be doing any good for anybody. So what we'll do in those situations is we'll do what's called jet ventilation. Uh, and basically it's compressed air that's shot through there. Uh, and basically that can buy you about 20 minutes or so. So you can get to the OR so the ENT can do a trach or anesthesia can intubate them or something like that. Um, and those are very, 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 very rare situations where you have such a complete upper airway obstruction. Um, we used to see it in like the 80s and 90s before the era of um, Haemophilus influenza B or Hib vaccines where kids would have epiglottitis and basically their epiglottis to so kind of that manhole cover over the airway would get super edematous, swollen, angry, and spasm shut along with the vocal cords. And you would just 
no matter what you did, you would not be able to innovate them from above. So that's how a lot of those kids ended up with those and trachs and stuff like that. Thankfully, in the age of vaccination now, we really don't see a lot of that. Um, and even kids who have such critical airway narrowing, our tools and equipment and techniques have gotten so much more refined over the last 20 to 30 years that we're able to do a lot of stuff with kind of fiber optic scopes and micro ET tubes and things like that. So it's a good tool to, you know, refresh yourself on, um, but certainly an extraordinarily rare event. Um, BVM, you all know that we have different size bags, infants and children, they're separate. Um, if you're overventilating, squeezing too much in, you can give them a pneumothorax. Uh, but really what we're aiming for is chest rise. And then if you can wean the FiO2 as much as possible, that's helpful in order for us to get a sense. But again, oftentimes you all won't have that. So 100% is perfectly appropriate for them. Um, CPR, we kind of talked about this already as far as infants and kind of preferred um, locations. I would think too, if you really can't feel a pulse, go ahead and lay a stethoscope on and see if you hear heart tones, because um, that's oftentimes helpful as well. And you might hook them up to the monitor and the most common presenting arrest rhythm for kids is PEA. So you might see an organized complex at 90, uh, but they don't have a pulse. So you guys got to double confirm those things. Um, and oftentimes I will say for cheat, like if you're in PEA, you will see an organized rhythm, but you will not have pulse ox reading. So that's another thing that you can use as a, like a triple confirmation as well. Um, and then compressions, you know, 30 to two versus 15 to two versus one versus two rescuers. And our goal rate is the same as kind of like adults, 100 to 120. Um, and, and, Always, if you can, put a backboard behind them or a CPR board or whatever you have, something that kind of you can compress against. Um, and that's true for both adults and pediatric patients. Uh, for infants, we prefer the, you know, encircling two hand technique uh, with kind of pressing against the sternum. Um, but two fingers is also appropriate as well. Um, the goal is at least um, one third of the chest. IV access, certainly preferred, IO, super reasonable. It's going to be the pink needle for most of these little ones, um, you know, the less than one year old kids. Though if you don't have it, like a blue is totally fine. Our preferred sites are going to be kind of proximal tibia or distal um, femur. Um, if you try in the proximal tibia and it goes through, feel free to put a blue on and go for kind of a distal femur as well. Um, and then you can give a lot of meds through the ET tube. We don't do it a whole lot because, again, we're able to do IOs a lot, um, and that's helpful. The other thing that you can do is kind of upper humerus as well, kind of rotate their arm in, and that's true for both adults as well as pediatric patients. If I'm working a code and I'm at the head of the bed and they're still not able to get IV access, I'll put an IO in here, and it's blue is just fine. It works great. Uh, medications, we'll talk about all these guys and their doses. You don't need to commit any of this to memory, I don't think. Just as long as you have something that can tell you this and offload it, it's hard to keep all of these doses and calculations. And if you guys are in a situation, you're like, hey, he's a pink. Can you help me with the med doses? We'd be more than happy to and talk to you guys on the phone. Uh, and this kind of down here gets back to like the rule of 50 for dextrose and pediatric patients. So if you guys remember, we did five cc's per kilo of D10 multiplied out equals 50, two per kilo of D25, one per 50. Um, so that can kind of help remember uh, that if you're ever in that situation. Oftentimes we will prefer D10. Um, it's less harsh on the veins. You have less kind of scarring that goes along with it. But again, if all you have is D50, that's fine too. Um, our nurses always get freaked out about pushing D50 in our like older patients. Would you bat twice if it was an adult? Probably not, but you know, we worry about these things. Um, other thing too is kind of oftentimes you're using much smaller gauges, so it needs a lot more force and you know how viscous D50 is. It's like pushing cement, so that can also be difficult and cause it to extravasate. The one other thing I will say about IOs um, is make sure you secure it down somehow because 
as you're pushing those meds, it wants to float back out and dislodge. And that's oftentimes what I'll see is crews will bring in, they've done a great job, they put in, you know, an eye gel, they've got IO access, we've given three rounds of epi or whatever, and I go to use the IO and it's out and hanging off the, to the side like this. So if you can, we have these commercial devices that come with the easy IO that kind of, they're basically like a giant tegaderm with a hole in the center that attaches to it and holds it down. If you don't have access to that, you know, kind of tape it down. You can use two four by fours rolled up in order to kind of support it and just tape the shit out of it. That's fine. Um, but really what we don't want is it for it to kind of be hanging off, dangling in the, on the side. Because oftentimes what that means is we just need to put another new one in. Um, but you, you want to be given these medications effectively. And I think that's something simple that we can work on. All right. Cool. All right. So as far as all of this, everybody talks about age divided by four plus four. I think that's other quick math that oftentimes gets confused, uh, which is why it's nice to offload a lot of these things. So what I think about is um, four, five, six. So if they're one year old, you can put a 4.0 ET tube in these kids fairly comfortably. Kind of the next phase is going to be somewhere around like four. Um, you can put a 5.0 in. And if they're above six, you can put a 6.0 in. Uh, or eight, you can put a 6.0 in. So kind of that's my quick thoughts about that. And this ET tube formula is only true for non-cuff tubes. So you have to subtract off half for a cuffed ET tube. Um, so if you can offload it, it's great, or use your Braslow tape. Um, and then as far as blade sizes go, usually for neonates, we'll use like a Miller Zero, so straight blade zero. For the micro premiums, we'll do a double zero, and they even have like a triple zero, which just looks like nothing. It's like that big. Um, and then kind of like a two for two and three for three is fine. Um, but usually, if you ever are working with us at Children's, we'll see, you'll see our most common blade that we use is probably a Mac 2. Um, and then if you're able to decompress the stomach, great, NGOG. And then your goal depth is the same as it is for adults, three times the ET tube size. Um, so usually you're not needing to put it in any more than, you know, 12 or a 4 or something like that. But really auscultating them and kind of listening, do they have discrepant breath sounds is probably more useful. Um, and I know some agencies have gone away from intubating everybody um, in arrests and kind of putting in the eye gel, which works perfectly well. And oftentimes we'll just leave them in while we're doing a resuscitation, whatever you guys feel comfortable with. I know this is a high stress situation. It's tiny anatomy, especially in neonates and like newborns. Everything is pink and slimy. You can't tell they don't. Their vocal cords aren't white yet. So it's oftentimes just this kind of pink amorphous blob with some bubbles there and you kind of are taking a stab and guessing uh, on what the right um, hole is kind of trial and error honestly all right questions about that stuff thoughts so what are your thoughts on uncuffed versus cuffed tubes i think most agencies have moved towards everything being cuffed yeah i think we should only be using cuffed tubes um, they prevent a lot more leak um, there used to be a lot of concern about subglottic stenosis and kind of if you left these ET tubes in for such a long time. Um, and the biggest thing I think was that we were overinflating the cuffs um, and kind of causing pressure necrosis to the airway. Um, we at Children's have exclusively moved to cuff tubes. The neonatal R, um, ICU over at UAB is really the only place that I can think of that still uses um, uncuffed tubes. And their thought process is that unlike adults where the narrowest part of the airway is the vocal cords for kids and particularly infants, it's right below it. It's the subglottic space. So right below is kind of where it narrows. So you think about it like a funnel. So their vocal cords are big and then it gets a lot more narrow. So their thought is, you know, we have these micro preemies who are going to be innovative for a really long time, um, you know, on the months you know, course of months, weeks to months, um, whereas most of our patients we can extubate in a couple of days. Um, so they will use uncuffed tubes, uh, but we oftentimes use cuff tubes. But if you're ever in a situation and the only tube you have is a 4.0 uncuffed, I'm not going to fault you for putting that in. Um, we'll probably exchange it at some point, but 
Yeah, most places prefer cuff tubes now, and I think the literature has really supported that as well. So, anything else? Even as agencies have video room discussion now, mm -hmm. do you think that changes the dynamics? Do you, do you foresee uh, kind of them backing off of the no intubation stance on bringing this? Yeah, I think the literature has shown that anything that you can use in order to improve your first success pass rate, so whether that be video, laryngoscopy, bougie, um, all of those things help improve basically probably the most risky procedure that we perform. Um, and increasing your first pass success rate helps improve and decrease their risk for mortality. It's so basically once you get in there and you're mucking around, it gets swollen, it gets swollen, it's swollen, and basically you decrease your chances of successfully intubating that patient uh, after multiple attempts. So yeah, I am 100% in favor for video laryngoscopy. I think it's gotten to a point now where it's relatively cheap that most people can afford it. You know, Ferg has like his own that he just carries around with him in his backpack. Um, so I think we will certainly get to a point where that is 100% standard of care. I even think now like the art of direct laryngoscopy has really fallen out of favor. Like uh, outside of the neonatal intensive care unit, like I can't think of a single place that we routinely do DL. One thing would be in the operating room, like anesthesia will do it. Um, but even then they have video readily available. And if you're ever at Children's and working with us, we're 100% reaching for the VL, so that way everybody can take a look at it and see, and we can all feel a lot better and kind of see. The other nice thing too, is you can record and take photos of what you're seeing in front of you fairly easily. Um, so it's great for QA and QI as well, as far as kind of like giving feedback on like, what were you seeing? Was that a good view? Um, and it really helps kind of when, it's not just you saying, yeah, I think it, I got it past the cords, but no, everybody in the room can see it. So I think that is 100%. And I'm I'm hopeful that with that and kind of as people get more comfortable with it, certainly it varies from vendor to vendor, um, kind of whether they have hyperangulated blades and you use specific stylet or if it's just regular anatomy, kind of geometry, and you can just get by with, you know, your regular hockey stick um, kind of angulation or a bougie or whatever. Um, but feeling comfortable with whatever uh, you use for fairly, you know, rare events, thankfully, but I think, yeah, It'll, I think it will deviate into one way or another, depending on how frequently you guys see and innovate patients. Certainly, iGel makes it so easy to just stuff it in and kind of go versus mucking around uh, to get an airway. But I think utilize whatever tools you can in order to optimize your first pass success rate. So, you know, most experienced provider utilizing the method that they feel most comfortable with, um, utilizing VL, and if you're comfortable with Bougie, utilizing that as well. Thoughts, questions, concerns? Just have you all en enraptured here, huh? All right, um, six-year-old with asthma. Um, mom gave four puffs of albuterol and he's got poor respiratory effort and seems altered. He's got those vital signs. What do you guys think? Good, bad, something in between. Yeah, this should make your butthole tight. Like your sphincter should be clenched seeing these kind of numbers on this kid. Um, and especially an altered asthmatic is scary, scary. That kid is on the precipice of dying. Um, so I think about asthma, it's an obstructive airway process, right? They can get air in, but they can't get air out. And basically what's happening is, you know, all of the smooth muscles clamp down all throughout the lungs. Um, and oftentimes if you listen to them, they're gonna be breathing like this. And it might be you're listening to the freaking table. You're not hearing appropriate air movement and exchange between their effort and kind of what you're hearing. It's oftentimes what we call a silent chest. And that is terrifying to hear. You might hear like some upper airway, like <gasps> kind of like noises, but you're not going to hear that classic, like <gasps> kind of wheezing, right? Um, and especially with this kid is kind of Blake is portrayed. This is bad. This kid is probably a terrible asthmatic. Mom gave four puffs of albuterol, probably without a spacer. The spacer is the plastic tube that snaps onto the end of the puffer. 
And what it does is it holds the medication there so they can breathe it in and breathe it down deeply. If you were to just use an MDI, if any of you guys have asthma and you don't use a spacer, you're not using your medication correctly. And all you're really doing is coating your tongue and your tonsils. It's not getting way deep down into your lungs and your alveoli where it needs to work. So this kid kind of like tiring out, right? He's altered, his sats are in the trash, borderline hypotensive, and he's tachycardic. All bad things. Wes said he wants to give this kid epi. What else do you guys want to do? Anybody? Anybody got a protocol for an asthmatic patient and how to treat them? Yeah. How old the patient's medication was. Mm -hmm. You don't know if the mother administered it properly. Right. So, and if they were having that much of an issue, mm -hmm. having nebulizing albuterol with the face mask, not the little piece mm -hmm. pipe thing may work a little bit better absolutely yeah so this kid sounds like he's like pretty you know borderline somnolent i think 100 percent slapping him on you know back when i we didn't have a face mask we had to like jerry rig it and kind of like rip off the bottom of the bag and screw it into the top of the mask in order to be able to put it on uh, but whatever way you're able to get this kid albuterol effectively and i think a face mask at 100 percent because probably this kid if he's altered he's not going to be able to do and hold the pipe right um so I think 100% do that. And oftentimes that's what we do. We never use kind of the pipes or at all at children's. We just have a face mask that we'll kind of slap on them. And I 100% agree. Who's to say mom gave this medication correctly? Who's to say that this isn't like, you know, 18 year old brother's medication from 10 years ago and she just found it in the back of the medicine cabinet or whatever. Um, so yeah, kind of oxygenating them, getting them albuterol and then kind of like next steps. So I would think other things would be 100% epi. Does anybody know why that works? Absolutely. The other thing too that I always think about, I think about epi is like a, a garbage can kind of like treatment for asthma. It's like this kid is so sick, why not? Because uh, this could also be a presentation of anaphylaxis, right? You can get wheezing with anaphylaxis. You can get altered mental status. Maybe it's anaphylaxis to a peanut, and that's why he's wheezing, and mom was just treating his wheezing, and he's not getting better. Um, so giving him a dose of IM epi 100% works on um, your beta 2 receptors and kind of can cause some of that bronchorelaxation as well. Um, and then kind of as well to addressing the hypotension and tachycardia. So if you're able to put an IV in and give him fluids, it's definitely going to help. It's basically what happening. It's so like we talked about. They're able to get air in, but they're not able to get air out. So they're increasing their intrathoracic pressure. And his heart rate is trying to compensate for that. But as you increase the pressure within your chest, the IVC and SVC, so inferior and superior vena cava, as they flow back to the heart, get compressed and get compressed and compressed. And it slows your venous return. So what can happen in these kids is they get super barrel chested, like our COPD patients, and they get this diaphragmatic flattening. And basically they can arrest because there's no flow back to the heart and you kind of tamp it on it off the IVC. So if you can give them fluids, which is oftentimes what we do, you can kind of help stave that off. Um, so they gave a duonib treatment and he got worse and then got non-responsive and lost a pulse, probably because of what we just talked about. Um, the treatments that are proven to help decrease the risk of admission. So if we give them early and kind of early in their course, you can decrease the risk of admission are atrovent, steroids, and magnesium. Those are really the only three things that can kind of help as far as asthma goes. Any more. Uh, where I worked in Virginia, we did have, we had solumedrol. So we would give these patients like solumedrol early. And really the reason that is is because it's activating at the cellular level in order to change uh, the proteins that the cells are producing and kind of create this anti-inflammatory response. So that takes somewhere between one and three hours for that to work. So you're not going to have any immediate benefit for that. But if you get it in early, you can kind of help change their course. And then atrovent is the second part of the Duneb. And 
in addition to um, albuterol or ipratropium, um, and that can help decrease their risk for admission. So this kid arrested, but it sounds like he was probably going to anyway with kind of that story. Um, so other stuff as far as kind of managing these sick asthmatic patients, so kind of increasing their preload, giving them volume is going to be helpful. Um, and then kind of oftentimes we will stave off. We'll do anything that we can in order to avoid intubating these patients because they are such high risk for arresting as soon as you paralyze them. Um, so you'll see us give them medications. We'll give them ketamine in order to try and disassociate them and try to coach their breathing in order to facilitate them being placed on BiPAP. You'll see us put them on high flow nasal cannula. So heated and humidified and kind of continuous albuterol. Um, we now do like 20 milligrams an hour. Um, which is basically, you know, a little less than 10 of the vials that you guys carry over an hour. Some places out west will do up to 150 milligrams an hour, so they will just crush these kids with albuterol. Um, and surprisingly, they don't have any bad outcomes with it. Um, and then there are other kind of medications that we use, like terbutaline, which is basically IV albuterol. Uh, and we'll use that if these kids are so tight that no matter how much you're giving from above, it really is not able to get down deep in the lungs and disseminate. Um, so we'll give them those as well. And then the ultimate trump card would be if you do intubate these patients, you've adequately resuscitated them, you've addressed all of their kind of electrolyte abnormalities, you've tried to optimize their oxygenation before you paralyze them and intubate them. The intubation so much isn't the scary part of it. Like they have normal airways, they're not super swollen. The problem is managing them on the vent afterwards because it is so hard to do. So sometimes what you'll see us do is we'll like innovate them, put the tube in, and then just compress their chest and see how long they exhale for. And these kids will exhale for 12, 15, 20 seconds, something like that. And then you'll see us crank down the ventilators to single digits, which normal is like what? We breathe 12 to 20 times a minute normally. Uh, and these kids oftentimes will be breathing 40, 50, 60 times a minute beforehand. And now we're gonna crank them all the way down to six, eight, something like that. And it's really just to kind of allow them to empty and exhale and kind of force compression out. So you'll see these kids will come in and big barrel chests, tube them, compress them, and you can just hear them just exhale forever, it feels like. And then kind of you'll set an appropriate ventilator rate and kind of just tolerate them being really acidotic because of how high their CO2 is. Um, the other cool stuff that they'll do is they will put them on like an anesthesia machine. So sevoflurane, isoflurane, like basically general anesthesia um, is probably the most potent bronchodilator that exists. Um, so you will see these kids basically hooked up to anesthesia machines in the pediatric intensive care unit, and you can just watch their CO2s plummet. If that doesn't work, then the ultimate trump card is ECMO. So basically heart lung bypass. Um, and that comes with its own risks. But that's the ultimate thing in order to turn those around. So questions about asthma management? All makes sense. So if I could take one thing away, it would be give these kids albuterol early if they have a known diagnosis of asthma. For your kids who are less than two years old who are wheezing, it is very unlikely to be asthma. It is more likely a viral induced process that's causing them and they probably won't respond to albuterol. But if they look like trash in front of you, nobody's gonna fault you for giving albuterol. But let us know whether you think it improved or didn't improve them. But usually the parents can tell you, oh yeah, they've had this wheezing before, they're given albuterol and they've improved. Or they were a preemie and had bad lung disease and they're on albuterol to begin with. Or yeah, they have terrible asthma and they take QVAR or Flovin or whatever. Uh, and please feel free to treat those kids fairly aggressively. All right. 14-year-old um, depression, found down by mom, uh, pulseless, and not breathing. So you guys are doing PALS, and she felt a little nauseous and gave her child some Zofran earlier. And then she took an SSRI for her depression earlier. Any thoughts on what we're getting at here? with the RNT. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like on the monitor? Mm -hmm. So that's the thing about torsades versus polymorphic VTAC is you have to have a prolonged QT. So this 
sets you up for that perfectly with SSRI and then Zoloft. And boom, there it is. Um, so kind of the torsade de point. Uh, how do you treat that? What else? Mm -hmm. Some good old Alabama power, right? Um, so you're going to give them mag. And how much mag do you all carry? Two grains? Something like that. Four grains? Oftentimes with these patients, they're going to get crushed with it. Like, I think we'll start with six grams, right? Normally, something like that. Um, but as much magnesium as you can give, and that helps stabilize the cardiac membranes and kind of everything like that. Um, but yeah, between magnesium and electricity and defibrillation and good chest compressions, you should be able to get this patient out of it. Boom. All right. Lots of talks. Y'all are now pediatric resuscitation experts. Y'all have questions for me about anything. And we did have someone online mention of uh, racemic epinephrine. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? We don't carry racemic, I don't think. Yeah. Is that on the formulary now? I don't think it is, is it? it you can is carry it? it, but you can't hardly find it. Can't find it. Yeah. Yeah, so I know some people have, have played around kind of trying to make racemic. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, sir, you know, when would that be indicated uh, versus a uh, B-roll? And is there kind of a act to make it? It's a good question. Um, so racemic has been on back order now for, I don't know, a couple months, it feels like. Um, and really what racemic is, as opposed to like the epi that you guys carry, is it's a specific enantiomer. So kind of think about there's different, how the atoms exist within kind of geometric space. There's kind of, they rotate to the right or they rotate to the left. Um, and racemic is just one specific of those two, whereas the normal epi has some 50-50 usual um, kind of concentration of both of them. Racemic is really only indicated for upper airway obstruction, so kind of up above. So I think of it extra thoracic process. So the most common one would be croup, uh, which is caused by a virus. There are a bunch of different viruses that can cause it, but most classically it's parainfluenza. Uh, for all of you playing Jeopardy at home. Um, and that's the most common. It's going to be the call that you get at 3 a.m. in the morning for the child who has this barking cough. And then when you walk in and they're <laughs> kind of stridulous, if you listen to their lungs, you're going to hear like a refer, you know, is that wheezing? Is it not? But if you put the bell of your stethoscope around their neck, you're going to hear the loud. <laughs> and what we care about and when racemic is indicated is when the child has strider at rest. So if they're sitting there happily looking at you and they're going, <clears throat> go ahead and give them the racemic. And really all that does is it lasts for about 20 minutes and helps decrease the swelling by kind of causing vasoconstriction. It's not gonna be a one-shot stop. The big treatment for that is steroids and what we give is dexamethasone, 0.6 mg per kg, max of 16. And that really kind of takes that time that we talked about. So usually if you bring us a kid who has strider at rest, um, we're going to give them a racemic, we're going to give them steroids, and then we're going to watch them for about two hours or so. And by that time, the steroids should have kicked in. They should no longer have strider at rest. That's really the only indication for racemic uh, is that or, you know, you had a kid who recently had tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, say, and they have post-op swelling and strider. I think that would be an indication as well. Back in the day, before we had synthesized albuterol, we used to give inhaled epinephrine in addition to IM and IV for treatment of asthmatics. Um, but really that's no longer standard of care. If that's all you have, eh, it's probably not gonna hurt anything, but that's kind of really the take home as far as racemic goes. Um, you really can't make racemic epi because of like the biochemical properties. Like there's no way to separate and just get the one-sided enantiomer of it. But what I have had people do and what I used to do and what I've taken phone calls on from other hospitals who are like, hey, I got this kid who's crouping and we don't have racemic because you can take like one ml and dilute it in four to five mls in a nib and give it to them that way. That's probably fine. Um, 
like if you really want to get into the fancy like you know med calculations of it racemic epinephrine is a 2.25 percent solution and you can kind of figure out of the one to one thousand or one to ten thousand like how much but i think that's just too much math i think if you give them and dilute it in four to five mLs within a neb, it's going to be locally concentrated in the oropharynx and upper airway. It's probably not going to cause them any systemic symptoms. And I think if anything, it might make them feel a little bit better. So I think that's totally fine. So if you guys call us in the middle of the night and you say, hey, I have this kid who's crouping and we can hear them being stridulous in the background, I think we might gently suggest you guys try that and see kind of what it does. The one thing I don't want you guys to do with a croup patient is just slap them on oxygen. And the reason that is, is because if they have such severe upper airway narrowing that they are hypoxic and you just put oxygen on them and they show up, then I don't really know where they are as far as kind of like their disease process until I take them off oxygen. And you can actually mask how hypercarbic they are by just putting them on supplemental oxygen. So if you have a crouper in front of you who's hypoxic, please call us and let us know and give us a heads up because that kid is probably going to be sicker than just your routine run of the mill kid who kind of had a barky cough in the middle of the night. But that's really the big things in learning points about croup and racemic epi. Would qualitative technology be useful? Absolutely. Hey, thanks, Doc. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, thanks for stepping up. Yeah. Uh, everybody, if you didn't hear the beginning, Doc Person had to step away on an uh, emergency. And um, so we appreciate Dr. Uh, Goodman stepping up. The first time here is our new EMS fellow for the UAB Department of Emergency Medicine. And, uh, got to give an unexpected lecture. So we appreciate that. It's very good. And we're going to take about five or ten minutes. Everybody stretch your legs and you're in the back uh, for our next lecture with Dr. Mayor. Let's get started back. We've got uh, Dr. Barrett, Jesse Barrett, the uh, second name right now. It's with us today. It's tough she's name today. Year, oh, uh, it's tough name today. <laughs> and uh, she's going to see what's going to be a non-dramatic abdominal. Okay. Um, so I'm Dr. Barrett. I am a second year resident at UAB. Um, I got tasked with covering everything that could go wrong in your belly that's not trauma. I don't have any disclosures. So when I started lo looking up how to approach this lecture, I thought about all of the different um, organs in your abdomen. There's a lot of them, and there's things that go wrong with every single one. And then when you continue to think about what else is in the abdomen, you think about everything behind all those organs in your abdomen and everything that could go wrong with every single one of those. So I came up with a list of every single thing that could go wrong in your abdomen that's not related to trauma. Um, and we are not going to go through every single one and talk about every single one of those today, unfortunately. <laughs> this would be like a 12 hour lecture. Um, so I just picked out um, basically ones that we see most commonly and kind of how I approach those diagnoses. Um, I'm not going to cover everything. So um, if there's something you're specifically wanting to learn about and I don't cover it. Sorry in advance. Um, but this is kind of the general approach I think most people use to abdominal pain is kind of a quadrant slash area approach um, based on where someone's having that pain, what you think is in that area and what could be causing that pain. Um, I put two asterisks at the bottom because their disease processes can present very differently. You can have things that are normally supposed to be a right lower quadrant pain that present um, in your left side or up in the right upper quadrant. So just um, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I wanted to start with an emergency medicine. We always think of worst first, things that can go wrong, things that tip you off that something really bad could be happening. Um, so I call them signs of badness. Um, so any kind of rigidity, if you feel a patient's belly, a kid or an adult, and it's hard, that's bad. You should be worried. Um, any kind of tenderness and not just tenderness anywhere, but like just gently bumping them and they're in horrible excruciating pain, you should feel uncomfortable. Um, somebody who's writhing around and is in severe pain um, and you don't really know why and they can't get comfortable, you should be worried. Anyone who's had a lot of recent weight loss, um, pain that comes on very suddenly and is very severe. Obviously any patient who's hypotensive. Um, and I'm always a little bit more worried when that patient is older because um, Older people can present very weird or very subtly with really bad things. 
Um, things that you can't miss when someone comes in with belly pain is obviously um, ACS or a heart attack. Um, belly pain can, especially in females, um, you can present with just nausea and be having a heart attack. Um, so always keep that in mind when you have picking up a patient with belly pain. Um, torsion, whether it's ovarian or testicular, you don't want to miss that. Um, a aortic dissection um, or uh, ruptured aortic aneurysm, um, obviously you don't want to miss that. Mesenteric ischemia, basically your bowel is dying. Um, that can present um, with severe abdominal pain don't want to miss it. And then peritonitis, that goes with the rigid abdomen. Um, so before I move on, I wanted to kind of talk on um, older people. We kind of had a whole talk on babies, but <laughs> um, older adults present very weird with abdominal pain. Um, they often present a lot later in their disease course, um, and there is a increased morbidity and mortality in these patients. Um, a lot more of them have bad things going on. Um, compared to their younger counterparts, and a lot of them will need surgical intervention. Um, other things that we sometimes don't think about with older people is they take drugs that can cause them to not have a tachycardic response. So you could have an older person with normal vitals on a beta blocker that is would normally be tachycardic to the 130s, and that would make you worried, but they're on this medicine that they don't have that same response. Um, and then their immune systems are a little bit different and they just sometimes don't even have a fever. So you could have someone with normal vitals without a fever that could have something really bad going on in their belly. Um, so just kind of have a little higher index of suspicion and they may not have peritoneal signs. Um, I was reading um, an article in preparation for this that said that up to 80% of older adults with a ruptured peptic ulcer can have no signs of peritonitis. So you could feel their belly and they might have a little bit of tenderness and that's it, which is pretty huge for, you know, having a belly full of gastric contents. Um, and then this is just a little side I found online about appendicitis. Um, so geriatric patients, sometimes you don't, you think of it in younger kids, they come in with right lower quadrant pain, oh, they probably have appendicitis, but grandma who comes in just kind of acting funny and has normal vitals, you don't usually think about it. Um, some of them don't have as even a white blood cell count. Um, some of them have a UTI and they're um, diagnosed incorrectly with a UTI when they actually have appendicitis. So um, just kind of think about that and have a higher index of suspicion in your older patients, um, especially like nursing home patients. Um, so first we're going to talk about, we're kind of going to go through the different areas of the belly. So first is epigastric pain. So kind of right up here in the middle. Um, the things in bold are things I'm going to touch on, things in red, things that you should think about, but I'm not going to talk about today. Um, we could have a whole lecture on STEMIs and ACS, but um, we're going to skip over that. Um, but we're going to talk about gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis. Um, also, things that can cause epigastric pain are obviously um, different types of gastric cancers or biliary cancers, um, gastroparesis in your diabetic patients um, who are just not pushing their gastric contents along can have epigastric pain. Um, and like I said, ACS and dissection are also can cause epigastric pain. So first, your peptic ulcer disease and your gastritis. This is your common GERD patients that you see every day. Um, so how this kind of presents first, how the um, the passive physiology of it. So basically, in your gut, you have this balance between your protective factors and your destructive factors. So you have um, hydrochloric acid in your stomach um, that is kind of buffered from burning the lining of your stomach essentially by mucus. Um, and if there is too much gastric acid production or loss of this protective mucus, you get um, peptic ulcers. Um, some common causes of peptic ulcers are H. pylori. Um, I don't know if you see that a lot here in Alabama, but definitely in Florida where I'm from, we see that all the time. Um, it's a bacteria that um, produces enzymes that kind of break down um, some of that protective mucus. Um, NSAIDs, they decrease your prostaglandin, so like your ibuprofen um, can cause um, decrease of that protective layer. Um, severe illness, such as burns or hypotension, you can either get um, decreased blood flow to the gut, which can cause ulcers, or um, even like things like increased intracranial pressure can cause um, your vagus nerve to kind of produce more acetylcholine, which causes um, ulcers as well. Um, and then this chronic um, reflux and increased acid production can lead to um, kind of reflux symptoms, esophageal cancer, stuff like that. 
Um, so how will these patients present to you when you pick them up? Um, it's usually this like gnawing pain that's kind of in their upper belly region that, you know, will be constant for a few weeks and then will come back a few weeks later. Um, usually traditionally we think of like duodenal ulcers. So the ulcers over here as um, getting better when you eat because when you eat um, your, um, your pancreas produces enzymes and bicarb that kind of soothes that area um, versus a gastric ulcer when you eat your stomach produces gastric acid and that causes inflammation and irritation of gastric ulcers. Um, if you have a patient who has known gastric ulcer disease or peptic ulcer disease um, and suddenly they have horrible excruciating pain, they're doubled over, um, always think of um, rupture um, and then bleeding ulcers can have melana or microscopic blood. Um, how they're diagnosed. Um, so the gold standard is endoscopy. Um, you have to take a look and see them to say for sure they have a peptic ulcer. Um, in the emergency department, usually we're not scoping people. <laughs> um, it's usually a diagnosis more of exclusion. It's our job to rule out all the other stuff, make sure they're not having a heart attack, make sure they don't have cholecystitis, um, make sure that they don't have pancreatitis, things that can cause epigastric pain. If we kind of rule all of that out, um, then we basically just treat them symptomatically, give them um, some PPIs and see if that helps. Um, you can consider a CT in older patients that you don't really know what's going on, but usually it's not something that you see on imaging. Um, and that's a picture of a gastric ulcer on endoscopy. Um, so treatment, I kind of touched on a little bit. Um, the two big things we use are the H2 blockers and PPIs. Um, so on the right side of the screen, you can see there's basically three different receptors that lead to increased acid production. So you have your histamine receptors, your gastrin receptors, and then your acetylcholine receptors. So um, your H2 blockers are going to block just that one histamine pathway, um, like your Zantac, your Pepsid. Um, and the PPIs, like your omeprazole, pantoprazole, whatever zole of your choice, um, blocks this end final pathway. Um, so PPIs are... Um, take a little bit to work. They take a couple days. You need to take them consistently, whether you're having symptoms or not. Um, and but they block all three pathways versus like your H2 blockers. They um, studies have shown they really only work for two, three, four days, and then you kind of get decreased efficacy there. Um, so usually, um, what I would do is I would put someone on an H2 blocker because it's more rapid relief of your symptoms, and then you have them take a PPI, and that kind of bridges the gap for um, longer term. Um, H. pylori, we treat with antibiotics and a PPI, and then obviously lifestyle modifications. You can't have anything fun or spicy or caffeinated. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> um, next, pancreatitis. Um, so a lot of things in the gut that we're gonna talk about today is something gets blocked, stuff behind it gets inflamed, and then that inflammation causes a cascade of symptoms. Um, so this is the same thing for um, pancreatitis. So your pancreatic duct gets blocked or there's some other kind of trigger that causes inflammation. Um, although the pancreas then gets irritated, it releases um, trypsinogen and trypsin and digestive enzymes, and then it, it basically eats itself. So you have all of these um, digestive enzymes, they don't get emptied out like they normally do into the bowel. Um, and then you have your pancreas getting inflamed and necrosing. Um, and then as your pancreas necroses, you get systemic release of infl inflammatory factors. So you can actually get um, systemic symptoms like um, ARDS or lung disease from just pancreatitis um, or just SIRS or sepsis um, from pancreatitis as well. Um, so here's a lovely list of all the things that could cause pancreatitis. Um, most common causes are gallstones and alcohol, um, but you can get pancreatitis from all sorts of stuff. And a good percentage of pancreatitis is idiopathic, which means we have no idea what happened, but now you have pancreatitis. Um, clinical features. Um, so these are patients that when you pick them up or see them, they're doubled over in pain. They have severe pain right at the top. It doesn't go away. It's kind of like an ulcer disease where it's very like gnawing. Um, you can sometimes get pain radiation to the back is um, a typical textbook um, description of pancreatitis. They'll be nauseous. They'll be vomiting. They look very uncomfortable um, and it can be sudden and severe. Um, if they're jaundice or yellow, um, it can in uh, indicate that there's some blockage is causing the pancreatitis versus anything else on the list. Um, and then this here on the right is um, 
colon sign. Um, it is a something you see pretty rarely with pancreatitis, but um, it's another textbook thing that we learn. Um, it's from hem hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So you get blood and then it can you can see it in the flanks or you can see it kind of um, around the umbilicus. Diagnosis. So basically um, how we diagnose pancreatitis in the ED, you need two of the three. So you have to have characteristic abdominal pain that makes you think, huh, this could be pancreatitis. You have to have a lipase, which is three times the upper limit of normal. Um, it varies based on what your lab report says what normal is. Um, and then some kind of imaging evidence to support it. So um, if you have abdominal pain and elevated lipase, you don't need to do get imaging on these patients unless you think um, you're unsure about what the cause could be. Um, and then we always also check like liver enzymes and stuff like that to make sure that it's not a stone causing the pancreatitis because like we said, that's one of the most common causes. Um, and then another thing we can also check, um, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone actually get it in the ER, but triglyceride level. <laughs> um, it is uh, triglycerides greater than a thousand can cause pancreatitis. Um, and then I just put this scoring system. Um, we don't use it a ton in the emergency department, but it's just something they can use upstairs to kind of predict uh, mortality based on, you know, what your labs are and how you present. Um, so these are some pictures um, of pancreatitis. So here on the left, um, this is actually a biliary stent, but this is what a normal pancreas will look like on CT. It's kind of fluffy, light, um, and then this is your big, fat, inflamed, thick pancreas with some um, fluid around it um, is pancreatitis. But like I said, you don't need imaging if you have everything else. Um, complications that we think of a pancreatitis. So if you pick up a guy who says, I have pancreatitis all the time, this is kind of just like my pancreatitis, take me to the hospital. Um, things that can go wonky with pancreatitis is people who have it all the time can get a chronic pancreatitis, which is what you see in the top right. Um, you get like calcifications and your pancreas essentially just like stops producing the enzymes it's supposed to. Um, so then those kind of patients can have a totally normal lipase and still have pancreatitis. Um, other things that can happen, basically anything around that pancreas can get inflamed and irritated and it can um, cause issues to structures around it. So you can get actually clotting of your splenic vein. Um, you can get bowel infarction, um, stuff like that, that just because the surrounding structures are all irritated and inflamed. Treatment. Um, Years ago, we used to recommend um, large volumes of fluids, like something ridiculous, like 500 cc's an hour. So if you're um, in 24 hours, you're getting 12 liters of fluid, which is like a little bit obscene. Um, and you would tell the patient they can't eat anything. Um, now they did a waterfall trial. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine, I think in like 2020 or 2022. Um, it recommended a much more conservative approach. Um, it showed that patients had um, similar outcomes, but less likelihood to be fluid overloaded um, if they received basically a small fluid bolus. If they've been vomiting for the last three days, give them some fluids to perk them up, but then give them like 15 cc's an hour, uh, 50 cc's per keg per hour, um, and just feed them if they will want to eat. Um, and then like all of our abdominal pain, treat their nausea, treat their pain. Um, these often require opiates because they're in significant pain. Any questions about the epigastric area? Okay, moving on. Right upper quadrant, um, we're gonna cover basically all of the biliary stuff, biliary colic, cholangitis, cholecystitis, cholecystitis, um, and then other things in the right upper quadrant. Um, Fitzhugh Curtis is basically um, pelvic inflammatory disease, like STIs can cause inflammation of your peritoneum and you can get adhesions and pain around your liver. Um, hepatitis, um, hepatic congestion, um, any ulcers can present with right upper quadrant pain. And then another thing to think about is stuff above that. So like a lower lobe pneumonia or a PE can also cause right upper quadrant pain. Um, gallstone disease. So as you think about all the different kinds of gallstone disease, um, it can be a little confusing. All these words are very similar, but yet very different. And um, we learn about all this stuff and we don't know what anyone's talking about, um, but we'll go through it. So basically, um, biliary col. Well, first of all, cholelithiasis. All that means is that you got stones in here. Most people have them. A good percentage of people have stones. Don't usually cause a problem. Um, biliary colic is one of those stones comes up and pops into your um, duct as your uh, gallbladder is squeezing, and it causes um, temporary inflammation and pain. Then that stone falls back into your gallbladder. The pain goes away. Um, 
cholecystitis is where something gets stuck and it doesn't fall back. So you have con constant pain, inflammation, um, you can get fevers, chills, stuff like that. Um, and then you can also have cholecystitis, where the stone makes its way all the way down here, sometimes even obstructing that pancreatic duct, and that's how you can get pancreatitis um, and stuff like that. So there's cholesterol and bilirubin stones. There's multiple causes for both. We don't have to go over all of them. Um, but basically, like um, kind of like the pancreatitis, you get some kind of blockage. You get back pressure, inflammation, decreased blood flow, um, and then ischemia of that organ. Um, it presents usually as right upper quadrant pain. Um, biliary colic is I just ate a big greasy cheeseburger. I have really severe pain, nausea, vomiting, and then a few hours later, that pain goes away. Um, and then cholecystitis would be, I ate a big greasy cheeseburger and now I have pain, it's not going away and it's been two days. <laughs> um, Murphy's sign is something we use in the emergency department. Um, if you press on their right upper quadrant and have them take a deep breath, they kind of stop breathing as you, um, as they take a deep breath because you basically push that gallbladder down onto your hand um, and it causes them pain because it's so inflamed. Um, right upper quadrant tenderness is not a Murphy sign, it's different. Um, and then you can get pain radiating to your shoulder blade back here, pain radiating to your back, um, all because of diaphragm irritation. Um, and like I said, symptoms will vary based on location of obstruction. Um, cholangitis is you have some kind of obstruction and then you have bacteria that crawl up in there um, and cause fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. That's like your um, classic Charcot's triad. Um, and then you can also have confusion and shock, which is basically just a worse form. <laughs> um, once you progress to shock, you're, you're pretty sick, obviously. Um, this is an example of a right upper quadrant ultrasound. You can see um, the stones in here with the shadowing behind it. Um, and then other things you'll see on ultrasound or sometimes you'll see some um, oop, fluid around the gallbladder um, and then thickening of the gallbladder wall. Um, is kind of what we look for to diagnose cholecystitis. Um, you can get a CT, but um, if you think it's cholecystitis, they've had these symptoms before, an ultrasound will do just fine. Um, and then, like I said, labs. And then complications, um, anytime you get inflammation and ischemia to an organ, um, especially the bowel, you can get perforation. Um, you can get abscess formation where you it perforates into your belly and then you get an infection around it. Um, and then you can get something called emphysematous cholecystitis, which is bacteria in the wall of your gallbladder producing um, gas and air. Um, so here's some more pictures. Um, this is a picture of a big thickened gallbladder with a big stone in the neck of the gallbladder. Um, and then this is a picture also big thick wall stone and then you can see um, some air in there too. Treatment. Um, like everything I'm going to talk about today, treat their pain, treat their nausea. If they look like they um, are low on fluids, give them some fluids, um, especially if they've been vomiting for several days. Um, antibiotics. And then um, two different ways that this is treated is um, kind of a two-tier approach. So if patients aren't very sick, the surgeon will say, okay, we can take it out and they'll just remove it. Um, patients who come in very, very sick, um, septic, that whole area is inflamed. So to go in there and try to take out a big inflamed, sticky, nasty gallbladder can be really risky. So they'll have IR place. Um, basically they stick a tube through your chest wall um, into the gallbladder and it drains the fluid and kind of lets the area calm down. Um, and then you can take out the gallbladder later. Um, and then if there's a gallstone, um, our interventional GI people can go up in there. Um, that's what this is. Um, they take a scope down your throat, through your stomach, um, and into your duodenum, and they can actually get the stones out that way to help relieve that pressure. Any questions about the right upper quadrant? I know we're kind of grinding through here. <laughs> um, lower quadrant, so I know some things happen in your right upper, right lower quadrant, some things happen in your left lower quadrant. Um, but I kind of group them all together because they can present on either side. And a lot of stuff that happens in your lower abdomen is from your GU system and it can be on either side. Um, so we're gonna talk about appendicitis, which is classically a right lower quadrant issue. Um, diverticulitis, which is usually left, but can be right. Um, ectopic pregnancy and then ovarian cysts and torsion. 
Um, there's a million other things that can cause lower abdominal pain, um, but that's what we're going to talk about. So appendicitis, um, like we've said, for everything else, you get something gets blocked. There's black pressure, inflammation, um, bacteria kind of invade, and it causes this inflammatory reaction. Um, and then same thing with the gallbladder. If you have something obstructive, it can perforate and lead to abscess um, as well. Um, clinical features. So usually the textbook presentation of this is you have sometimes a kid, usually a kid, <laughs> who presents with this vague pain in the middle of their belly. And then they, a couple days later, the next day, it kind of moves down to their right lower quadrant. Um, at a place called McBurney's Point, which is kind of right here. And then they have horrible pain, um, but this can be very variable. Um, bye guys. <laughs> you can have um, right upper quadrant pain in pregnant women. You can have left lower quadrant pain if you have a very long appendix or a cecum that kind of wraps around. Um, this is a picture of all the different places your appendix can be in relation to your cecum. Um, so it's pretty variable and causes very, variable pain based on where it is located normally. Um, one of the things that um, I kind of raises my suspicions for coli or for appendicitis is anorexia. So if mom says, or I don't know, your husband or whatever says, she usually eats like a horse and she hasn't eaten for three days. I would, that kind of raises a red flag for me um, to think more about appendicitis. Um, and then these are just different maneuvers we can use. Um, basically what these do is these basically stretch out the muscles kind of in your upper pelvis and back that your appendix sit on, sits on. And if that causes pain, it can be a sign that you have an inflamed appendix. Um, here's a picture of a, a, a appendicitis, um, big inflamed appendix. Um, basically our job in the ER is to rule out other causes of pain, make sure people aren't pregnant, make sure they don't have like a UTI or a stone or something that can cause pain in that area. Um, kids, especially pregnant women, um, just get an ultrasound. Um, if it's questionable, we don't know, we can't see the appendix, um, you can get a CT. Um, pregnant patients will sometimes get an MR because um, to decrease radiation. Um, so here's a picture on the upper left is um, where it's measured out is a big thick appendix. Um, and then down here is a picture of an ultrasound image where you see um, it's thickened. There's the wall. The wall is thickened. There's some fluid around it. Um, treatment, control their pain, control their nausea. Give them fluids if they need it. Um, give them antibiotics. And then um, I was looking up how this is managed because um, I feel like it's so hit or miss whether the surgeons want to go in and do something about it or not. Um, but it turns out there is a 2020 New England Journal of Medicine that showed um, that medical management was non inferior to surgery, which basically means like they they sent some people to surgery and said, we're just going to give you antibiotics and fluids. And the outcomes are pretty much the same. Um, they did note that about 30% of people who were managed medically still had to have their appendix out by 90 days. Um, but a lot of these were um, patients that you could see a stone blocking their appendix. Um, so um, it's kind of up to the surgeon how they want to manage it. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, diverticulitis. Um, so this is basically a disease where um, years and years of chronic constipation, chronic pressure on your colon cause the walls of your colon to kind of outpouch. Um, like this picture here, and you get these little um, pouchings that alone diverticulosis is just the pouch. Um, if it becomes inflamed, filled with fluid, you can get what's called diverticulitis. Um, so a ton of people have diverticulosis. They don't know it. They live every day with diverticulosis. It doesn't matter. It doesn't impact them. Um, but a small person or 50% of people over 50 have diverticulosis. Um, and of those, um, some can progress to diverticulitis, about 10 to 25%. Um, so here's pictures. Um, upper right is, you can see these little kind of pouchings, out pouchings of the colon, not inflamed. And then this is what it would look like if you got like a colonoscopy, these little out pouchings. Um, but it presents usually as like a constant left lower quadrant pain. Um, not a ton of um, bleeding usually. You can get some bleeding, um, but the main presentation is changes in bowel habits. So extreme constipation, diarrhea, stuff like that. Um, they can have a low grade fever. 
Um, and then if they have a perforation, so if one of those out pouchings kind of perforates out into your belly, um, you can get pretty sick and present with like hypotension and signs of sepsis. Um, diagnosis, this is usually made on CT. Um, if you have, if someone comes to me and says, I have diverticulitis, this is just like my diverticulitis flare. Um, we usually just treat it um, symptomatically. We give them some antibiotics. Um, but if they've never had a history of di diverticulitis and they come in with horrible lower belly pain, it's usually an older person. We usually end up getting a CT on them. Um, and then you can see on CT the little out pouchings. Um, this one's a perforated diverticulitis because you can see the free air as well. Um, and that will lead us into complications. You can get um, an abscess around where it perforated. You can actually get fistulas. That's what this is a picture of. So your colon sits pretty close to a lot of structures and you can get like, this is a um, colovesicular fistula where you get perforation into the bladder wall and then people can like pee out poop, which is never a good thing. Um, and you can also get like um, fistulas with your skin and stuff like that um, and severe, severe disease. Treatment, control their pain, control their nausea. Um, antibiotics, if they're going to be inpatient. If someone looks really good and has a primary care doctor they can follow up with, um, you can discharge them on some PO antibiotics. Um, surgery is an option, but usually the surgeons want everything to calm down and stop being so inflamed and sticky and nasty before they go in there and try to remove the colon. Um, usually people who have recurrent diverticulitis um, usually are the ones who get surgery, Not, um, but they'll have to go through a couple rounds of antibiotics and prove that it's necessary. Then we have ovarian and testicular torsion. Um, so it is what it sounds. Basically, your ovary or your testicle twists around its blood supply and cuts off blood supply to that gonad. Um, testicular
millimeters. It's a pretty healthy person. Um, you just treat them with pain control. You can give them some Flomax or Tamsulosin um, to see if you can kind of push that stone along. Um, if it's greater than six millimeters, I'm calling urology. If it's infected, I'm calling urology. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Would you make sure your microphone's still on? We lost your sound for some reason. No, it says it is, but the light's not on. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, I got the microphones off the top. You can Talk finish and we'll look at your batteries. Okay. Um, any questions about renal stones? Um, high low um, is basically you get a UTI that goes up to your kidneys. Um, most common is E. coli. Females get it more than males just because females get more UTIs than males just because of our anatomy. Um, you get pain when you pee and then um, CVA tenderness. So I'll tap with my fist on someone's back and they'll be severely tender, jump off the stretcher. Um, that's when I start to bring up high low. Um, you can get fever and other systemic symptoms once again. Older people can just be confused and have pilo. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen plenty of old, little old confused ladies that end up having UTIs. Um, diagnosis, like I said, if they have a positive UA and CVA tenderness, um, you don't usually have to go much further, but it depends on the situation. Obviously, older people tend to get CT just to make sure there's not anything else going on. Um, get a urine culture to make sure you're treating the bug correctly, make sure they're not pregnant. Um, get check out their renal function. Um, treatment is similar to a UTI. Some antibiotics you can't use because they won't penetrate the kidneys. Um, so just you have to keep that in mind. Um, so that's pilo. And then I kind of did a grab bag of random stuff at the end, things that kind of present diffusely and you won't really have one specific area. Um, once again, always worry about aneurysms um, and dissections, uh, but I'm going to touch on obstruction um, and or volvulus and ectopics. So ectopic pregnancy is basically you have a fertilized egg not in the uterus is um, the long and short of it. It can be anywhere. It can be in your cervix. It can be in the wall of your uterus. It can be in your fallopian tube. Uh, it can be up in your liver. Um, so it per, per, can present very differently based on where it is. Um, I think of this as a spectrum. Um, you can have patients who say, huh, I don't know, my belly just kind of feels weird. And you can have patients who present in hemorrhagic shock that are going to the recess bay and are like dying. Um, so it can present very differently based on where the pregnancy is, if it ruptured a tube, if you have peritonitis, if you have hemorrhage. Um, an interesting tidbit to think about if you have a woman of childbearing years who's having belly pain and are bradycardic, think about um, blood in the belly. You can get um, bradycardic from hemoperitoneum. A loud voice now. Okay. Um, diagnosis, like I said, very variable, presents on a spectrum. Every single female of childbearing age that is a female of childbearing age gets a pregnancy test. I don't care if the, what they tell you, um, assume that they're pregnant until you prove otherwise. Um, Check a CBC, make sure that they aren't anemic. Um, we always get type in screens, both to give blood products, but also to check their RH factor to see if they need Rogam. Um, and then transvaginal ultrasound. So if someone's pregnant, we check an ultrasound, see if the pregnancy is in their uterus. Um, if it's an early on pregnancy, sometimes you won't see um, the gestational sac in the uterus, um, but you can kind of see based on rough estimates, kind of if your HCG is this level, this level, this level, what you should be able to see. Um, but if you have, you know, uh, high HCG and no pregnancy in the uterus, you have to assume that it's somewhere else in their body. Um, so these can be kind of scary. Um, you can see here on the bottom, you can bleed a significant amount of blood into your pelvis. Um, these women can be hypotensive um and be in frank hemorrhagic shock needing transfusions you can see um over here the the ovary and the ruptured um tubal pregnancy um up here is something that kind of scares me women who have ivf they can have a elevated hcg and you can see look at this beautiful pregnancy in the uterus um, but you can also have an ectopic elsewhere um, usually i don't worry about that unless it's women who've undergone like ivf or something um because the chances of 
um, that are pretty low otherwise, but something to think about as well. Treatment, if they're unstable, they need to go to surgery, obviously. Um, if they're stable, you work with your OBGYN friends to decide if they need to be, um, get a DNC, um, which is basically you just dilate their cervix and scrape everything out, um, or some of them can just be managed with methotrexate, um, but that's kind of at the purview of our OBGYN friends. Um, that's a picture of a ruptured tubal, kind of where the tube meets the uterus. Um, and then bowel obstruction. Um, cause um, bowel obstruction, adhesions from previous surgeries. Um, your bowel can kind of telescope into the other bowel. You can get twisting of the bowel. Um, small bowel obstructions are more common than la large bowel obstructions. Um, it can be mechanical, which means like something's twisted or the actual structure of the intestines is weird or functional where you don't have any mechanical obstruction, but it just is not moving stool along like it should. Um, most common causes of small bowel obstructions are adhesions. So after surgery, you get all these like big sticky fibrous webbing that your bowel can kind of get stuck on and twist around. Um, large bowel obstruction, you always think about cancer. Um, same thing as always, you get blockage, you get black back pressure, decreased blood flow, and death of that bowel. Um, and you can have perforation and sepsis. Um, so these are some pictures of adhesions. It's a cartoon, but you can see like you get all these big sticky fibers um, from your belly being opened and kind of scarring back down, um, and your bowel can slip through those. It usually is crampy intermittent pain with a history of surgery. You have a lot of nausea and vomiting and not passing stool. But you can have patients that are still passing stool um, and have an obstruction. Um, sometimes, especially in like older people that get super, super constipated, they can actually have like liquid stool that leaks around their obstruction and they still are obstructed. Um, diagnosis, here's some pictures. Um, X-ray can kind of differ differentiate a large bowel versus a small bowel obstruction. Usually, um, so this is small bowel, you can see kind of these little lines go all the way across um, versus a large bowel. They have like um, the lines that go kind of to the middle. It doesn't go all the way across and you can see the obstructive point right there. Um, usually surgery surgeons will want a CT, so we CT them. Usually an x-ray is not sufficient, um, but you can diagnose it with just an x-ray. Um, treatment, usually put in an NG tube, um, treat their pain, treat their nausea, give them fluids if they need it. Um, if there's signs of perforation or infection, you can do antibiotics, um, and then you're going to have to fix whatever is blocked. Um, some patients with ileus, so patients who are in the ICU or patients who have um, take a ton of opiates, just aren't moving their stool forward. Um, th those patients can just be treated with bowel rest um, to see if it kind of picks back up again. Um, but if there's something blocking it, you need to take the blockage away. Another picture, um, this is a picture of a volvulus, so the whole bowel kind of twists around and you get this kind of like coffee bean shape. Um, and then this is a picture of an obstruction. You can see like the fluid in the bowel and then the air kind of layering on top of it. Um, you get like this thickening of the bowel as well with like inflammation. Um, so before I finish, I just wanted to go over some like we call them pearls, but like things to remember. I know I just talked to you for like an hour about everything that go wrong in the belly, but not everything that could go wrong in the belly. <laughs> um, but think about um, location is not always set in stone. Think about everything when you pick up someone with belly pain. Um, always consider GU. So consider um, your kidneys and your ureters. Consider ovaries. Every single woman of childbearing years is pregnant. So be careful with the meds you give them. Don't give them meds. Um, that can be teratogenic, like um, NSAIDs, for example, if it's a woman of childbearing years and you don't know if they're pregnant or not. Um, older adults can be very, very sick and not look very sick. Um, anyone with a rigid abdomen or severe, severe tenderness, you bump that stretcher and they're writhing in pain, you should be worried. And don't be afraid to advocate for your patients when you drop them off. Um, we had a lady a couple months ago that was at like a hair salon or something and suddenly went to the bathroom and had severe, severe abdominal pain. And she came in and was writhing around on the stretcher. And one of the nurses came up to me and was like, could you just like see this lady? Like she's just writhing around and like won't be quiet. And she ended up having mesenteric ischemia. Um, so just be have a very high index of suspicion for these um, patients and believe them if they're in horrible pain. Um, and don't be afraid to say, hey doc, I pushed on their belly. It's pretty rock hard. Just this might be someone that you might wanna see first. Um, 
and then we can take it from there. Any questions at all? I know that's a lot very fast. So one thing uh, Dr. People were kind of talking about EMS right now is that you know ultrasound is definitely um, EMS is already. They talked about a lot today from a just a assessment triage point of view. What did you tell that you can see an ultrasound in the hospital to be able to kind of differentiate sick from non sick and these abdominal I would say that like if you could get good at a fast, um, that would be hugely beneficial. People can have a lot of reasons for blood in their belly or fluid in their belly, like ascites or liver patients, they'll have fluid all the time. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're bleeding. Um, but I think that would be the big thing. I mean, you don't need to diagnose cholecystitis pre-hospital, but if you can say, hey, we did a quick fast, they have a ton of fluid in their belly, they're not a liver patient, um, especially for like ectopics or a rupture triple A, that can be huge and expedite care, I would say. Um, the rest, I mean, you can, you have a middle, a million things to fiddle around with back there. You don't need to be diagnosing some of the lower acuity stuff, but I definitely think that that's huge. Does anybody else have any uh, questions for Dr. Farron? Questions, comments? Uh, once again, sorry, Dr. Bergson had to head out for an emergency. I appreciate everybody uh, participating with us today, both in person and online. Please remember to fill out an attendance form. You'll get a certificate emailed to you for today's attendance for your CEUs. Uh, if you're listening online, there's a link at the Q&A section. Yeah. Or you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated response with a link to the attendance form. The password for the attendance form today is the word trustful, like city of trustful, but it's all lowercase. So trustful, all lowercase. Please, even if you don't need to see you, use the modern intense form so that we can get your feedback and get record of your attendance. So thanks everybody. We'll see you in two weeks from now. We'll be in Troy, Alabama at Hawkins Hall. And if you live down that way, please start making plans to attend. If you're in the trustful area, we're going to have some lunch. And then about noon, we're going to start a skills lab. So please feel free to come by and join us for skills lab. Thanks everybody. See you next time.